Hi, I'm Mark Talbot. I've been a philosophy professor at Wheaton College in Illinois for a little over 30 years. I'm writing a four-volume series entitled Suffering in the Christian Life. Some of you will know that we sent 20,000 copies of the first volume, When the Stars Disappear, to African pastors through Rafiki. Karen's asked me to tell you a little bit about myself, about the first two volumes which are published, and if we have time, I'll say a little bit about the last two volumes which are currently being written. I was prompted to write When the Stars Disappear when I lost a student to suicide in the early 2000s. I'll call him Graham. Graham had been my student from his freshman year. He was quite bright, he was deeply Christian, but he had been plagued by depression for many, many years. I had started to talk to him regularly about his depression, and at one point, I decided that I should be talking to his parents also, and so I started to do so. He, after his senior year, went overseas to do some language study to prepare for going on to get a PhD in philosophy, and he took his life by stepping in front of a train. Now, you can imagine what that did to his parents. It threw them into what we can call profound suffering. I define profound suffering in the first chapter of When the Stars Disappear as experiencing something so deep and disruptive that it dominates our consciousness and threatens to overwhelm us, often tempting us to lose hope that our lives can ever be good again. It seems to me that there are at least two kinds of profound suffering. There's that which we could say involves calamities. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines a calamity as an extraordinarily grave event marked by great loss and lasting distress and affliction. And the other way that we can suffer profound suffering is by means of a chronic condition. So for instance, it seems to me that Graham's parents after his suicide suffered a calamity. A chronic condition might be something such as caring many, many years for a well-beloved but severely disabled child. Either calamities or chronic conditions can cause us to suffer profoundly. And when we do, what's most distressing to Christians is that quite often we can't trace God's hand in what is happening to us. We can't understand why he's allowed whatever it is to be happening to us. Now, my reason for writing these books is pretty closely tied to the fact that in 1967, when I was 17, I fell about 50 feet off a Tarzan-like rope swing and broke my back. I was paralyzed from the waist down, spent six months in the hospital, trying to learn how to walk again. And when I left the hospital, I was able to walk very awkwardly with one or two canes. I continued to walk that way until about 2005 when I had to switch over to forearm crutches because my legs were getting so weak. And then in fact, in 2017, when I took a spill, leaving my study early on a Saturday morning and broke a hip, I've been in a wheelchair ever since. It's been my experience of the way that God has met me and upheld me and cared for me, not only through, but in fact because of my suffering, that I've thought about these issues pretty deeply. One of the points that I make at the end of the first chapter of When the Stars Disappear is that we need to make sense of our lives in terms of two kinds of stories. The first is a personal story. And of course, as you'd expect, that's a story about what our personal lives mean. It's going to have to do with our history, with what's happening to us currently, what in fact we hope will happen to us in the future. The other kind of story that we need in order to make sense of our lives is a general story. A general story tells us what human life means. And in fact, we need both of these kinds of stories in order to make sense of life. I contrast the general story that Christianity offers us with other general stories in my second volume. But in the first volume, what I'm trying to do is show that 
Christianity, and in fact the faith all the way back to the beginning of time, as recorded in the Old Testament, that the Old and New Testaments both are very frank and very open about human suffering. Sometimes we as Christians really don't think that's so, because until we have suffered pretty significantly, we can kind of skate over the passages in Scripture that deal with suffering. So what I try to do in that first volume is I try to help people who are suffering see that Scripture, in fact, addresses their situation and gives them reason to hope. So, in fact, in the second chapter, I deal with the suffering of Naomi and Job and Jeremiah, three major cases of suffering in the Old Testament. You'll remember those stories to some degree. You'll remember that with Naomi, that after she and her husband and her two sons had moved to Moab because there was a famine in Bethlehem, that in fact her husband and then her sons died. Uh, her sons had been married but hadn't produced any children, and as a result she was left as a widow in a strange land, which was a very difficult and dangerous thing in the ancient world. She came back to Bethlehem. One of her daughters-in-law, Ruth, came with her. As they entered Bethlehem, the, um, the, the former friends of Naomi and acquaintances of Naomi said to her, is this Naomi? Now, we really don't know whether or not that means that they didn't recognize her because her grief had transfigured her, or if instead it was just this kind of surprised way of saying, this is Naomi. But in any case, her answer is interesting. What she said was, no longer call me Naomi, which means pleasant, but call me Mara, which means bitter, because she felt that her life had gone so badly that, in fact, it could never be good again. I stop in the second chapter at that point, at the depth of her grief, and then I pick up on the story of Job. And you'll remember that Job, in fact, from all we can tell, had no sense of what the first two chapters of Job tell us about God's uh, making a, um, um, a bet with uh, Satan about whether or not Job would hang on to his faith if God took away all his blessings. Job just lost all of his children, lost his land and everything else, and in the midst of that, the question was, would he continue to praise God, or would he, as his wife wanted him to, curse God and die? I deal with Job's story uh, up to the point where he, in fact, has his deepest expression of grief, or at least one of them, where, in fact, what he says is, my eyes will never again see good. And then at that point, I pick up on Jeremiah's story. Jeremiah's story is of a man who had been called by God from birth to be God's prophet. But as his life moved forward, it became so awful with regard to everyone turning against him. All but four people in the book of Jeremiah uh, turn against Jeremiah. And he finally, in chapter 20, is tortured. He's put in the stocks. And when he comes out of the stocks, he, in fact, accuses God of having deceived him, uh, of God having treated him so badly that it was the equivalent to his having been raped. And at that point, he, of course, wants to renounce his mission, his calling to God. Now, I have those three stories up to that point in chapter 2 of When the Stars Disappear. And I break off there. And the reason I do is because, in fact, I want people who are suffering to recognize how deep the grief is, the suffering is, that God portrays to us in Scripture. I then take a chapter that I call Breathing Lessons, dealing with the Psalms of Lament, of which there are more than any other Psalms. And uh, I try to get people to understand by thinking their way through the Psalms of Lament, how God means for us to respond to suffering when we're suffering deeply. I won't say much more about that right now, 
What I do in the fourth chapter, the final chapter of When the Stars Disappear, is that I pick back up on Naomi's and Job's and Jeremiah's life. And I show the way that their lives end. And in fact, in two of those three cases, with Naomi and with Job, their lives became good again. It wasn't true that Naomi, that Naomi should in fact have a permanent name change where her life would be known uh, in terms of its bitterness. At the end of the book of Ruth, she holds her grandson in her arms and her life is good again. Similarly with Job, at the end of Job, although no doubt he always was aware of having lost his children uh, at the beginning of his story as it's given in the book of Job, he's blessed with even more children, he's blessed with even more wealth, his life, in fact, uh, becomes a life that is satisfying again. Interestingly enough, though, with Jeremiah, that doesn't happen. With Jeremiah, throughout the entire book, Jeremiah, uh, after chapter 20, is faithful to God, but in fact never knows his life becoming good again, partly because God was using Jeremiah as a way of indicating to Israel what was going to happen to them. So Jeremiah, in fact, his book doesn't even end by recording his death. It just breaks off. And when it breaks off, that's where we realize that, in fact, he has been faithful from chapter 21 on, despite the fact that all of his life he is living in profound suffering. So my first book is trying to deal with these personal stories, these stories that have to do with the ways in which some biblical characters have understood God's presence in their lives in spite of and through their suffering. The second volume is called Give Me Understanding That I May Live, which of course is a quotation from Psalm 119. The point of the second volume is to give us what I call the full Christian story. The full Christian story is the story of creation, rebellion, redemption, and consummation. Those are the four chapters of the full Christian story. And what I'm trying to do by recounting what Scripture tells us about each of those chapters is give us a way of understanding God's story, the story that God is telling through Scripture and that God is bringing about in the world in such a way that we can, how should we put this, we can align our personal stories with the story that God is telling. In that volume, one of the main things that I want to do is to make clear that, in fact, suffering is not just uh, an occasional thing in human life since the fall. In fact, we all suffer to some degree every day. And so, in fact, what I want to say is that what suffering comes to, if we really think carefully about it, is this. We suffer whenever we experience anything that is either unpleasant enough or harmful enough that we would want it to end. We suffer whenever we experience anything that is either unpleasant enough or harmful enough that we would want it to end. Now, if we keep that definition in mind as we go through life, it helps us to understand a lot that we wouldn't understand otherwise, and it helps us indeed to live as God would have us live. Let me explain why. If you think about it, every day, if we work the way that we are supposed to for God, we ought to be tired at the end of the day. The way that I put it to my students is, if you're not studying hard enough, if you don't take your um, studying in college to be at least the equivalent of a 40 hour a week job, if you don't feel tired at the end of the day, then in fact you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. 
because in fact part of what God did when he pronounced what would happen after the fall was he told Adam that he would have to scratch out his living from the ground all of his days. We're told also that the woman, in fact, of course, would suffer greatly in childbirth and that, in fact, um, her marriage would, in fact, involve tensions all of her life. All of that is part of the suffering that life involves. And some of it can be pretty minor. I'm usually tired when I'm at the end of a day's writing, but it's not excruciating by any means. Some of it, of course, raises itself up to a level that's greater than that, where something perhaps goes wrong that really hurts a fair amount. Maybe you damage a knee or you break an arm or this or that. And of course, some of it is profound suffering. The interesting thing is that all of that suffering uh, happens because of the way that our having sinned means that, in fact, um, that, that the causal regularities in the world that God put in them at creation, they're all talked about in Genesis chapter 1, where God does one thing and another thing and another thing, where he separates and distinguishes between things and puts the great light uh, in the sky during the day, in other words, the sun, the lesser light at night, the moon, and those uh, two lights regulate regulate life and account for our various seasons. In the first chapter of Genesis, before there's any sin, those causal regularities would bring human beings nothing but good. But once they sinned, once they sinned, even creation itself, we could say, sagged and starts to groan. You find that kind of talk in Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 19. The idea is that all of creation now is eagerly awaiting the appearance of the sons of God. In other words, waiting for the consummation when Jesus comes back and we join him forever. And so the picture, in fact, in Scripture is that some suffering is now inevitable and not merely inevitable, but actually I think is generally good for us. Because as C.S. Lewis mentions in the sixth chapter of Problem of Pain, it is by means of our suffering that God speaks to us through a megaphone and makes us realize that things have gone wrong and that we need to think about what, if anything, can be done to make them right. Of course, what we find is that we don't make them right that God made them right in sending his son Jesus Christ into the world. And when I get to the question of redemption in the, third, in the second volume, um, I'm pointing out the ways uh, in which God, uh, in fact, gave glimpses of redemption from the third chapter of Genesis on, and how when Jesus came to earth and lived his earthly life and died his innocent death and then was raised bodily, that all of that is a sign of God's working in this world. And all of that, in fact, and especially Jesus' bodily resurrection, is meant to be for human beings proof, proof, as it's said, in fact, more than once in Scripture, in Acts, among other places, is meant to be proof that what look like these causal laws that, are nece that necessitate the way that things go and that mean that they will just go on forever, grind on and on until finally all of the usable, in the en usable energy in the world is used up uh, and is, is, um, is beyond the place where in fact there can be any usable energy at all. At that point, the whole universe will just die and there will be no persons. But Christ's bodily resurrection and the fact that so many people saw it, as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, is proof of the fact that our world is not a place of mere causal laws that will grind on until there's no usable energy left. It instead is a place where God himself is working through the world to redeem it. And perhaps the most wonderful thing of what we find when we think about our Lord's work is that as he told his disciples, uh, in 
becoming his disciples, we become his friends. Human life was created by God that we might be in communion with him, that we might, in fact, be his friends. And of course, what Jesus told his disciples in John, among other places, is that that, in fact, is actually what has come about through his earthly life, death, and resurrection. So I have these two volumes that are already finished. One of the points that I try to make in the second volume is this, is that you can explain the world either top down or bottom up. To explain the world top down means that you explain it in terms of someone's intentions and purposes. So in other words, a top down story would include the fact that if a really young child were to say to her mommy, mommy, what are you doing? And her mommy said, I'm getting ready to go to the grocery store. That's a top down story. That's telling us what the mother is uh, getting ready to do. She's doing, she's going to do something according to her intentions and purposes. A bottom-up story instead doesn't bring in personal purposes at all. It is in fact a story that just tells us that things go on the way they go on because of there being various causal laws. And of course, in our time, since Darwin wrote, uh, the main bottom-up story is a story of evolution. And insofar as it is told as a story that excludes the belief that God in any way could be guiding evolution, insofar as it includes the idea that in fact human beings only came about by chance, insofar as that's so, then in fact what would be true would be that ultimately human beings don't exist for any purpose and aren't accountable to anyone. But we as Christians think otherwise. Let me just say one more word about these two books. I tried to write them in such a way that anybody can understand them. So in fact, the main text is written as simply as I can, even though we're dealing with important and sometimes difficult concepts. There are scriptural references that run throughout the texts because it seems to me that we shouldn't make any theological claims without trying to show where we base those claims in scripture. And then there are endnotes which expand on what is said in the text. And what I suggest in a couple of pieces at the end that involve advice to my readers is that these books are best read three times. Once you read just the main text, the next time you'd go through and you'd read the scriptural references, the third time, you'd start at least sampling your way through the end notes. And the idea is that ultimately then, uh, we in, I hope, a relatively painless way, can get to the place that we understand these topics in depth. Let me give you one example of this. I mention in one of the end notes that is attached to the third chapter of When the Stars Disappear, in other words, the one on breathing lessons, that Derek Kidner, one of the great biblical commentators of about two generations ago, that Derek Kidner says that, in fact, for David, when we look at Psalm 13, the third and fourth verses, that for David, life has two poles. The first pole, as Kidner says, is God. And he says that for David, but for whom life would be insupportable. So without God for life, for David, life would be insupportable. The other pole is the enemy. And that's whoever, in fact, is attacking and opposing David and the Christian um, way of looking at things. The enemy is uh, the pole where um, David simply must not waver. It's unthinkable that he waver from his belief in God. And what Kidner wants to suggest is that in all of David's Psalms, in all of the Psalms, and now I'm quoting him, awareness of God and the enemy is virtually the hallmark of every Psalm of David. Every Psalm of David has an awareness of God and the enemy. It has, in other words, 
positive and negative charge which are produced as the driving force in David's life in his best years. So we have the positive pull God, the negative pull um, uh, David's enemies, and they produce two charges which, in fact, working together, as Kidner puts it, produce the driving force of David's best years. So in other words, a certain kind of suffering was what kept David near God. That's been my experience too. I mention in an article of mine called Broken Wholeness, which in fact I've sent to Karen if you'd like to see it, that when I fell off that rope, that suddenly uh, all of the distractions in my life fell away and that I knew that in fact God was speaking to me and saying that he cared for me. I had felt, as I say in that piece, that my life was spinning out of control and that I wasn't going to be able to make anything of it whatsoever. And the interesting thing, and this doesn't usually happen to us with suffering, but in fact I found it to be true now for over 50 years. Um, um, what I found to be true was that uh, that fall, at the very moment that I hit the ground and I realized what I had done, when I knew, in fact, that I had paralyzed myself, I saw that as, uh, as a chief instance of God's love for me. And it's always proved to be sense. I don't think I'll say anything about the third and the fourth volumes right now. If you're interested in those, stay tuned. Uh, I hope that you might find these first two volumes useful in your life and in the lives of those that you know who are suffering, and especially the second volume, since really knowing the full Christian story is more important than knowing all of the details of our personal stories. May God bless you.